Thanks very much, Henrik. And hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and have the opportunity to to have this exchange with you and, and try to present uh, a few ideas, indeed, about Europe today. And I have to confess that I wanted to first to come with good news for a youthful audience, but I didn't find it. And as we say, instead of one good news, I, I have at least two bad news to start this discussion. Uh, first, the, I mean, the situation is Europe, in Europe is, I mean, pretty much dramatic in terms of unemployment and so on, and I revert on it. And, and second, we don't have any obvious solution. So it's just to start with the exchange, but to say, I mean, our point today is extremely uh, uh, complicated. And we, don't ha we do not have uh, obvious options, and more than 70 years after the beginning of the crisis, the average European unemployment rate remains at nearly 25% today for people under 25. Which means that our issue, and I think our main challenge today in Europe, is just how to deal with a potential lost generation. I mean, your generation. And for me, that's our main duty as politicians today, which is, I mean, to try to figure out, I mean, why are we in such a situation? And what should we do in order, I mean, in order to find the right ways to exit this situation, i.e. to find new perspective for the whole continent, to find new perspective for this European youth, and to preserve and find a new ambition for Europe. Otherwise, I mean, we will have your generation in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, in Greece, more or less in France, I have to say, with European experience will just be about unemployment, constraints, and it will be our responsibility not to have been able basically to, I mean, to find this, this new perspective. And, and like most of the rest of the globe, the euro area indeed hasn't suffered one but two crises during the recent period. First, the 2008 crisis, the, the so-called financial crisis, and I don't want to revert on it, you perfectly know everything about that, and a specific euro crisis between 2009 and 2012, largely a sovereign debt crisis, uh, during which basically we destroyed our output, we weakened our e economic potential durability, and our challenge today is how to avert a form of a secular stagnation, to quote one, one great American uh, uh, economist, and how to end the current lesser depression. That's our challenge. And behind this economic fight, there is a political fight, the one I mentioned, which is how basically to find a new place for this generation, for your generation, and how to restore our, com I mean, our common European ambition and how to find basically this, this, this new way. And I do think this is our common responsibility. There is no one French way, I would say. There is no Germans on the veg. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't exist. We have a common way to construct, to build together for Europe today. First, to restore growth, to restore employment, and to find a new ambition for your generation. And that's why, for me, the first pillar of this momentum is about how to reconstruct what I called, indeed, and like the New Deal. And for me, the New Deal is reforms in our countries, and especially in France, where we have a lot of work to be done, and creating a European momentum through these reforms to have more ambition and especially more, ambi more investment at the European level. Uh, I see two sets of responses in the short term to restore growth and rebuild a form of affixio societatis between member states, which is precisely to, to manage basically to bridge the gap between North and South, between creditors and debtors, because today we have to deal with this lack of growth, 
but with this lack of trust between a lot of member states. And I have to say, sometimes even between France and Germany, because sometimes there is a lack of trust to say, are you sure you want to reform, guys? And on the other side, are you sure you want to invest? And I think what we have to do is a sort of a progressive common approach. We have to trigger this approach as French people because we didn't reform 10 years ago. But step by step, we have to create this momentum and rebuild this, this common trust. That's why first, I do think that we have to boost our respective economies. And this involves deep structural reforms to stimulate activity and unlock potential. And it is absolutely necessary to ensure that the crisis doesn't leave permanent scars on our potential. And this is particularly necessary in France because our productivity gains have been slow and because over the last decade, we have lost market shares and seen our competitiveness deteriorated. And this is for me the key condition to reindustrialize our country, which is my core mission as an economic minister, because French reindustrialization is part of our answer to this deal, precisely to bridge the gap with Germany and work on the convergence agenda that especially Henrik and Jean Pisani Ferry proposed in the report uh, uh, that Zygmar Gabriel and myself received a few months ago. And to detail the French agenda, I would say we have a sort of five arrows as uh, five pillars of our modernization agenda. The first one is cost competitiveness, because we had very low margins for our corporates and lack of competitiveness. And this cost competitiveness approach is precisely the one we addressed through the tax credit decided in 2012 and now the responsibility pact implemented last year and de facto implemented begin from beginning of this year. And we will reallocate basically 40 billion for corporate margins in the coming three years. That's a very challenging choice giving, I mean, our fiscal situation. But in the coming three years, we will make 50 billion cuts but we will reallocate 40 billions to corporate margins because this cost competitiveness issue was key for us. And you cannot ask basically your corporates to innovate, to employ people without any margins. And their margins was, I mean, were basically too low due I mean, to the increase, especially of wages during the past decades and due to the increase of a lot of costs during the past decade. So that's the first pillar of our strategy. The second pillar is non-cost competitiveness, i.e. how to increase quality, how to, I mean, precisely specialize our industry in the right sectors, and how basically to increase R&D, innovation, and so on. That's for part of your, the German industry what you succeeded. And that's why first we decided to preserve and increase some ambitious tax credits for companies that invest in R&D, and we have very attractive uh, uh, instruments for that. And we decided basically to invest uh, uh, in innovation R&D for corporates. And we decided basically as well to, I mean, making our economy gearing to the digital um, era. And I'm working in, on a new set of measures precisely to accelerate this digitalization of our economy as precisely one of the non-cost competitiveness key pillar. And you are working in Germany on the industry 4.0 and this new digitalization of, of your economy. I, and I do think it's extremely, it's key. And we have to work together on this agenda. It's for me part of this convergence agenda between France and Germany. And we will accelerate basically our work on this part of uh, our policy. The third pillar is precisely investment, the third arrow of our economic policy. Because we need investment. There is a lack of investment in France if you compare our situation today with 2007 situation. There is a lack of 40 billion of private investment. So we have to re-stimulate this investment. We decided precisely to have a series of investments focused on our top priority on industry. So we define a series of, of plans, and I'm reshuffling to define 10 top priorities for the French economy. 
on digital health and so on. And to focus public investment to trigger smart private investment. And for instance, from September 2013 till now, we invested 1.5 billion, which triggered in total 3.5 billion on these top innovative sectors. On, on top of that, what we want to do is to, to, do, to go further investment through European channels. I will revert on that with the UK plan. But on the public and private side, we do need in France to stimulate investment and we will announce in the coming weeks and months a series of, uh, I mean a series of measures precisely to go further and stimulate investment because that's key at this moment precisely to recover and invest especially uh, on the productive sector. Third arrow, uh, I mean, third, third top priority, third arrow of, uh, of our economic strategy is goods and services market and reforms in this market. It's how to unlock the economy, how to open certain sectors which were till now captured by some players or overprotected from, I mean, globalization, innovation and so on. So that's, I mean, the law we are, we are passing at, uh, at the parliament. Uh, and that's exactly our purpose. I mean, we basically tackled the transport sector, professional services sector, the energy sector. I mean, a series of sector where in France till now, you had a sort of overprotection. You had a sort of capture by insiders. And when you unlock these markets, first, it creates innovation. Second, it increases your competitiveness more largely. But third, it's much more fair because you open the door to newcomers, to outsiders. And it means that this sector is not just captured by insiders. I mean, the two to three ones, which, I mean, we were already there and working basically with the existing interests. So this modernization of our goods and services market is absolutely key for growth, but as well for our political willingness to reform the country. And the fifth arrow is about labor market. And for me, that's exactly the same philosophy. In France, we have a very protective labor market. We don't have the same social consensus as in Germany. And I, I do think that the strict equivalent of the arts law would not be possible today in France due to, I mean, the fact that we have different regulation, I will revert on that, and the fact that we, we need a consensus to reform. But we started to facilitate restructuring to secure and provide more visibility for employers in case of individual layoffs, for instance, and a series of technical measures. And we made the first step into that direction. We are modernizing social dialogue, and we want to go further, especially for SMEs, why? Because today in France, the fact that we are, I mean, a sort of first-class country for protection for workers is one of the explanation of the fact that we have 10% unemployment and 25% of young people without any employment. Because when you overprotect basically the insiders of the labor market, you create such a barrier for the outsiders. Like it make, I mean, it makes it much more difficult, basically, to get access to this market. It's very much counterintuitive, and Enrique, you were working about, you were mentioning the fact that we have to modernize, basically, the software, in a certain way, of, of social democracy in Europe. But it's part of this modernization. Because classically, when you were a social democrat, you were just here to increase rights. But now, we, you always have to deal between insiders and outsiders. And sometimes increasing rights for some people means killing opportunities for some others. It doesn't mean that you have to liberalize everything. You have to abandon your ambition. At the opposite, I don't think today being a leftist means accepting to have 10% unemployment. It's just being in charge and revisiting precisely some obvious ways to proceed and to say, What's good for the outsiders? How to give a chance to give new opportunities to those we want to access, to those we want to work, to those who want precisely to create something. And I think that's our common responsibility and it's key to modernize our economy. So that's 
uh, pretty much our ambition today and we started to reform into that direction and that's exactly uh, uh, the framework, this, this five arrows of the decisions announced by the president in 2014 and the law I, I, I'm, I'm passing to the parliament. And we will keep on working on this agenda to modernize the country and in the coming weeks on these different markets, we will announce new measures precisely to unlock our, uh, our opportunities. And I, I do think that more generally, this is a big shift for a country that we have to organize where the labor contract is governed primar uh, I mean primarily by the legislator and the judge. And trade unions in France have historically a small role. And that's for me one of, of the key enlightenment of your report, Enric and Jean, which was to make our two economies converge on the social side. And I think in Germany you decided to implement a, a minimum wage in a, a series of sectors where you didn't have it. And I think we have to think about giving more place to the unions in regulating our labor market. We need precisely to reshuffle our organization and be much more inspired by the German ones in order precisely to decrease the pressure at the top level because the law is not today adapted to define everything about the functioning of the labor market, to define everything about precisely contracts for people, working hours, and so on. And we, we do have precisely to give more place to the negotiations between unions. And I think that's precisely what, what we want to change in the philosophy, basically, we do on those. And what we are really inventing in France is both a form of flexi-security and negotiated arrangements by the unions, like the German Kurzarbeit. And for me, this, this gradual approach is extremely important for the modernization of our economies. Nevertheless, th these reforms are increasing uh, supply in a situation of depressed demand. And all these reforms I'm presenting to you will not boost growth and employment in the short term. And we all know that. And I have to say, you experienced that 10 years ago. So being reformist today could be a killer from an economic and a political point of view, because on the short term, you don't have the positive outcomes, both from an economic and a political point of view. That's why I do think about, I mean, the relevance of this New Deal, which is in the same time we reform, we do need basically to be accompanied by an investment stimulus, which is first extremely adapted to our situation at the European level, and second, very smart from a political point of view, because you need a positive news flow when you implement such reforms. And that's why I do think, and we are progressing with our German partners, and both with Sigmar Gabriel and Wolfgang Schauble, we always have very fruitful discussion on these topics, and Germany increased, basically, commitments in terms of public investment during the past month, and I think it's a very important signal vis-à-vis -vis the rest of Europe, and especially vis-à-vis -vis France, because that's the best policy mix between France and Germany. For France, precisely, to, to make cuts and reduce public expenditure, for Germany, to invest, and to make it pari passu, progressively together. But as we are reforming our different markets, on this aggressive way, as I mentioned, we do need basically to have our economies fertilized, I would say, by much more public investment. And that's why the Juncker plan is key in this context. But Juncker plan is a good starting point because it will provide good financing, long-term financing at low cost. It will provide and we will push for that a corporate venture vehicle for our startups, our corporates in Europe, and we push to create such a vehicle on the basis of the Juncker plan with a few billion euro of equity components. But we do need more because we need an equity component. Because today the macroeconomic impact of the Juncker plan is definitely insufficient in comparison with the lack of public and private investment at the, at the aggregated level for Europe. 
there is a lag between 600 and one, 600 billion and 1 trillion euro in total for European Union. But we do need equity because it's not a question of funding today due to the very low, low rate and, and, and low cost of funding. That's a question of equity, how to provide actual financing to our economies. And we need to be much more ambitious at the European level. I mean, we need precisely through this new deal to have the demand component of our policy to push this growth, which means we do need a common ambitious investment package with a common equity. And that's why in order precisely to, to trigger such a new situation today, we have to deliver something more ambitious than the Juncker plan in common, which means we have precisely to refine the path of both reforms, investments, I mean common ambition at the domestic and European level. And that's, wh that's why I do think that this new deal is essential because it is a real way, I mean, to exist this crisis. And it is also the only way to change Europe into good news, not only a set of rules. But we should not stop there and we need to prepare the next steps too. And I don't want to be too long, but I just want to, f I mean, in order to frame our discussion, to provide my personal view on these next steps about Europe. Because this new deal for me is a very short-term ambition we have to deliver. Reforms, investments. But that's our duty in the coming month. But now we, I mean, we need first to rebuild the euro and second to restore our single market. And for me, that's the, the core ambition of the coming semesters, both for France and Germany. Because I do think that we have an extreme responsibility, precisely, to provide more ambition to Europe altogether. And if we don't deliver between France and Germany, nobody will deliver for, for us. And, I mean, you can notice that. It's not the Commission you will propose something for you. We have to do so. So first, for me, we have to rebuild the euro. It is sometimes forgotten that the euro was not only created as an economic project designed to strengthen economic um, integration and shelter the euro area from global monetary and economic instability, but I mean, it was much more than that. It was also a political project that, I mean, hoped to allow Europe to wait on globalization, to help reunite us uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and uphold Europe's distinct social and economic model. And we failed. We failed into this common political initial ambition. Because the first decade of the Eurozone was a history of divergence. So we have to rebuild the euro, I mean, we have to create the new ambition to make our economies, our societies, converge all together. And I do think that the euro architecture, as per the Maastricht Treaty, has showed its failings during the crisis. And in part because Maastricht was the result of a European compromise filled with constructive ambiguity about the fundamental nature of the monetary union. But we have to do much more. And I think we experienced, basically, the fact that this euro area was incomplete during this crisis. I think with the banking union, we provided the first answer. But it's very insufficient. And today, the key question for us is, how will we trigger the next step altogether? I hope without the new crisis. And in reality, it is the responsibility of France and Germany to kickstart this debate, this debate again. That's the debate we have with Sigmar Gabriel and Wolfgang Schauble. And I think it's, this dialogue, for me, is extremely important. And, and we, we were all together, four of us, with Michel Sapin, Sigmar Gabriel, Wolfgang Schauble. And I, 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 I do think it's very much important. But I, I think you have a very important place in this debate. I mean, young people have to provide ideas, ambition, ambitions. You have put, to put pressure on politicians to do so. Business people have to do the same. And I know that, I mean, we, we can see a lot of recent initiatives into the direction. I mean, the Cluny Group is extremely important. And, and you have business people from both sides pushing for more integration. And I think 
we have to favor this kind of initiative because that's how to make corporate society economies to converge into that direction. But I see a few fundamental questions that we need to answer to make progress. First, Eurozone versus European Union. That's the first dilemma. That's a critical question. First, because that's always a key question for our leaders when they want to meet. Should we meet in Eurozone format or European Union? They always meet in European Union because as soon as you start trying to figure out how you will organize yourself for a Eurozone format, you say, I will have an issue with Poland, perhaps with the UK, and so on. So you have a lot of philosophical questions. But at the end of the day, we share something all together. I mean, in 2011, we were together, I mean, at the verge of dying because of the euro. So we have something together. There is no shame, basically, to meet all together precisely to treat our questions. So as you probably understand, my vision is that we should not be afraid of a two-speed or a multi-speed Europe. And I think we have to stop with fake philosophical question about how to deal with EU. I mean, EU is there. We have European Union. It's fine. We will progress. We are in a certain way in a digesting phase of European Union at 28. We have to simplify a lot of things. We have to make, it much more, to make them much more pragmatic. But if we want to progress, if we want more integration, let's go at least at the Eurozone level, at the European Monetary Union level, and let's try some, something all together. So I do believe in the two-speed or multi-speed Europe, and this is already the case with the Eurozone or the Banking Union. And the failure of the constitutional treaty has frozen this debate in Europe, and maybe more so in France, I have to confess, because it was a divisive experience, and it was 10 years ago. But, I mean, your generation, my generation of, of political leaders cannot accept to be blocked because of a decision 10 years ago. Our common responsibility today, right after crisis, and in a certain way during this generational crisis, is precisely to decide to go further, to do something more, to integrate. So we have to do so. And because we have to exist the current crisis, we need to provide perspective to our people, and especially young people, and that for me is the essence of this ambition, deepen the EU with a new initiative on the single market DNA, and reinforce the Eurozone with new tools such as a budget or a coordinated unemployment insurance. We need new tools, new very ambitious common programs. And for me, common budget, coordinated unemployment insurance are two very important items for this Eurozone. The second key dilemma is about rules versus institutions. We always have this debate, especially between Germans and France. We are big specialists about that. We spent years to debate about potential contracts between countries and so on. It doesn't fly. And my short experience about what works and what doesn't work in Europe is that when you have institutions with clear prerogatives, it works. Look at the ECB. Look at banking supervision with the SSM and so on. I mean, it works. When we have rules, you, I mean, the second after, you have the question about, okay, is the rules violated? Is the rule adapted to our current situation? And we have constant debate about the rule and the rule is too complicated and so on. You need somebody to be entitled, basically, to work, monitor the system. So I do believe that creating new institutions at the Eurozone level is the best way to progress and go further. Rules are the best substitute in the absence of political integration and sharing of sovereignty. That's probably the explanation of the fact that we favor rules. But if we want to face a situation and go further altogether, we spread of rules, the spread of rules in the governance of the euro betrays a lack of trust between member states, if you want my deep feeling. And the lack of, of trust between I mean, member, member states vis-a-vis -vis the European Commission. And trust is the asset we lack most. We need trust. So we need precisely to accept some sovereignty transfers to, I mean, give the poor, a democratic poor, so with the 
with the appropriate check and balances to institution precisely to lead this new integration. The third dilemma is about the executive power. Who could trigger such an initiative? Commission versus intergovernmentalism, which is a big question we have between France and Germany and a key question for a reformed uh, European Monetary Union is who exercises political discretion in a certain way. And it is essential that we set in motion a new institutional setup where the Commission will be politically responsible and democratically accountable. Because when I look at our recent experience, we constantly favor intergovernmental approach, which is, I mean, the best evidence of the lack of trust vis-a-vis -vis the Commission. But it doesn't function, I mean, it functions to precisely to solve some issues during crisis. But that's not the person, sir, to construct something new, because that's impossible to find a permanent compromises between all of us for common interests. And it was the original role of the Commission not to make the nitty-gritty instead of the member states and to explain one government, you should reform like that, or much more like that, or to refresh basically your guidance every three months. I mean, that's not, that's not the historical role of the Commission. The role of the Commission is precisely to be in charge of European common interests. I mean, it's much more complicated. But that's what we need. And that's what we need as well at the Eurozone level with the appropriate democratic regulation because that's the best way to progress. And these are the fundamental politi political questions about the future of the Euro. The rest is either technical or financial and should come second. But I do think that between France and Germany, we are first to face this issue if we want to progress at the Eurozone level. The second key point, and I will finish with that, is how to restore our single market. The history of the past 20 years has also showed the political and practical limits to expanding of trying to expand and deepen this precise single market in all aspects. I think it will not fly if we want a new step forward for single market in all areas. But I propose a more focused and pragmatic approach, focused on energy, on the digital economy especially, where I think we can build a, a consensus to go further, but to have a common agenda at 28, precisely to deepen the single market, because it's efficient, it makes sense from a political point of view, and that's the best way to progress all together. I know that France has always been, in a certain way, caricatured as reluctant to promote the single market agenda. Sometimes we, prob we probably provided, I mean, good reason to, be, to have such an image. But at the end of the day, I can tell you that I'm totally ready to endorse such a step forward. But if it's a pragmatic approach, if it makes sense, if you can explain people, it will create new rights for you. Look at it, it's good for you. Not from an ideological point of view, otherwise it doesn't make sense. We need to be clear about what this entails. We keep a very Jacques Delors outlook on the single market. The single market is about liberalization, but also regulating this market. And to the extent possible, this involves reg I mean, creation and centralized authorities to do so. And finally, an integrated market does create agglomeration effects that may require solidarity. And this convergence is, for me, a fundamental European promise that we cannot abandon. <laughs> Otherwise, countries will turn their back to the euro, to the single market, and then to Europe. And this was, I mean, this was a great deal of the Delors era. And I couldn't put it in, in better words than Jacques Delors himself when he said, competition that stimulates, cooperation that strengthens, and solidarity that unites. And I think that's the three pillars of this ambition. And just in order to conclude this, uh, this lecture, uh, I mean, I've just tried to explain that we all need more Europe to exit this crisis. We have a first step in the coming month to deliver with reforms and investment. France has a big responsibility because we have to reform right now and we don't have to stop because Germany was waiting for us. But in the same time, we have to progress at the same pace and nobody has basically to pay and especially your generation should not pay the lack of trust due to the past generation and all the past mistakes. It would be a, a big, 
a big failure. And we need to open right now this new era, these new ambitions. We have to define all together this new ambition, and I try to frame this discussion, because we need perspective in this situation. Because what we need is to rebuild this common culture, the shared experience, and finally, a polity. I mean, what we need is to create an actual political community with this new attachment, basically, to common convergence, common projects. I mean, those who created Europe had this common ambition due to, I mean, precisely their common experience after war. I think that our generation has a new ambition because we've experienced this crisis. And Europe, potentially, is almost finished. I think there is a big risk today. There is a big risk. Because when you see populists basically raising in a lot of countries, when you see sometimes a third or half of a generation with our jobs in a lot of countries, Europe is at risk. And when Europe is at risk, the only way to answer is to go further, to make one step further, <coughs> together. I think that's a unique answer. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. You, you can stay there. I just feel the best. I'm, I'm yours. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, we, uh, we now open uh, it up uh, for question and answer period. Um, uh, the minister has kindly agreed to, uh, to entertain a few questions. What, what we'll do is... Uh, since we're quite a large number of people in the room, we start on, from my side, perspective on the right, and we then move uh, to the left to make sure that we get uh, uh, enough um, questions in, and we take them in groups of three, and I ask you to be brief and uh, say who you are, and preferably you say that you're a student at a Hertie school. Mm -hmm. uh, before we have the first question, I have to share a little story with you. Um, it's about a year ago when... Um, uh, we started uh, having a conversation uh, here uh, from the Hertie School with, uh, 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 with uh, you in, in Paris. Then, and we thought, uh, in fact, Hendrik suggested this. Well, we, we know we have the Jacques Delors Institute and we have Jean Pisani Fury. We have a very strong, the beginning of a very strong intellectual bridge uh, to Paris. And it, uh, it's, it's working. And we are thinking new thoughts. We are producing interesting reports. And uh, there is this. Uh, a person, Emmanuel Macron, you may want to talk to him. Uh, he, uh, um, he may be interested. And uh, what I had in mind is, you know, can we have somebody from Paris come to the Hertie School and, uh, and do a bit of teaching, but primarily engage in an intellectual exercise of moving the European agenda forward? And let's then link it perhaps with London. That was the idea. And we had a meeting scheduled at, uh, at your office. And two days before I was to arrive with a very attractive package from the Hertie School, you accepted your current position. But I think we just could not compete right, with, uh, with that. So, it, so we're doubly delighted to have you here today. Uh, so let's take uh, a, a few questions. And I'm, I'm looking to that side of the room. Yes, please. There's the microphones that will be brought around. Yeah. Um, Astrid Williams, regrettably not a student of the Hertie School, um, but I'm sure I'm surrounded by luminaries. Um, Mr. Macron, thank you very much for a very interesting um, lecture. Uh, you started out by outlining eloquently the reforms um, that are needed in your own country. Um, and I was interested, I'd be interested to learn um, what you think the outcome or what potential outcomes of the, of the recent elections might have in terms of your ability to push through the reforms, in fact, even within your own party, because I believe the, you know, the left wing um, of, of the left of centre government may feel some discomfort at some of the reforms you're proposing. Thank you. Let's take uh, the next question. Yeah, it's uh, in the back of the room and there's uh, the lady yeah, if you could stand up so they can identify you easily. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Regula Hess, and I'm a student of the Hurdy School. Right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my question to you is, you spoke a lot about solidarity um, that we need in Europe. And you also, means, you also mean, I think, um, financial solidarity. 
And so I'm just doing a thesis about financial solidarity in Europe, and I spoke to a lot of politicians in France and in Germany. And in Germany, I heard a lot of, well, solidarity proposed by the French is just a means to get our money. And so the question I'd like to ask you is like, what do you tell uh, German politicians and also the German um, voters that we need solidarity and um, what are the benefits for them? Thank you. And one more question that's almost right next to you there. Yeah. Take a Hi, my name is Hector. I'm also an MPP student. Uh, I also would like to, for you to elaborate. I'm very interested in this idea you uh, said about changing the software of the center-left uh, politicians and you as a practitioner at, uh, at the big leagues. I would like you to elaborate a little bit more since you were uh, discussing this uh, soft governance, so to say, it, um, I, I get the sense, bilateral agreements with Germany mostly. So are you intending to mean that this new uh, social democracy solidarity is also uh, through a shared or a extended uh, sovereign, uh, well not devolvement, but like handing to Europe level? Uh, and or in, in more concrete terms, how do you intend to substantiate this new discourse for the uh, for certain center left parties thank you, thank you. so let's um, have these three questions and uh, if you thanks very much so. thanks thank you um, as for the outcomes of i mean of the recent elections for me you have three lessons the first one is that that's a victory from uh, the extremists and especially the front national in france and uh, i mean even if they didn't win any local authority after this election they increased when you look at the polls, basically the position. And I think the Prime Minister and the President will write basically to, to be extremely serious and, 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 and clear about the fact that the first attempt for this election was to block them. And for the coming month, it will be a big question mark for the classical rightist, precisely to see how they will deal with the populists because there was some ambiguity uh, during the campaign. But the first the first key outcome of, of this election is the Front, National, the Front National and the fact that now they have local roots, which will change a lot of things. The second lesson from, from this election is that basically, I mean, the classical rightists won uh, this election. They have more than 60 uh, departments and local authorities. And how to understand this victory for us as a government. That's local election, first point. Second, I didn't see basically any signal about you should, I mean, you should go to the left because the more leftist people basically lost completely their local election. They were beaten. And uh, I didn't see any specific factor when they opposed themselves to their government and their own majority. So there is no signal that we should go to the left uh, as a reaction to this election. And when I look at the past comparable elections, we are in a situation of a government with 10% unemployment. And that's, for me, the lack of results is the main explanation of the national component of the election. That's first a local election, but if you want basically to have a, lo a national explanation, it's just about the lack of results at this point of time. So for me, the answer is much more about efficiency of our policy than providing any signal to the leftists because the leftists basically didn't succeed, didn't succeed during this campaign. And people didn't, I mean, convey the signal that they want more leftist or a more leftist policy. And the third point is that we lost a lot of battles due to the division on the left. And the, the third lesson of this campaign is that we have to gather all the leftists. And if you combine my second and my third lesson, you should not gather them by making compromise which could jeopardize the, the efficiency of your policy. You have to work to accelerate on reforms in order to deliver and to have results before 2017. That's perhaps 
I'm straightforward, but that's a key explanation for me. That's a key explanation, it's a key rational explanation. And if you accept basically to make extremely complicated argumentation as a reaction to that, I think you don't get what French people have in mind. And you know, French people, they want jobs. They want to have a better life. They don't want symbolic approach of what left should be or could be, and I will revert on that with a third question. As for your question about solidarity, that's a big question mark. I mean, we had, I mean, it was one of the key fundamental questions of banking union, because in banking union, I mean, through the banking union uh, uh, structure, basically, we de-risked the Eurozone. Thanks to more control, we created, I mean, we decided precisely to put all the control of the bank at the central level, I mean, uh, for, for, at, at the European level with uh, the ECB, I mean, or a, a proper regulator. But in the same time, we accepted to have solidarity and financial solidarity between banks themselves with a private backstop, but in last resort between government because we have a common public backstop. So you have the first step of a sort of solidarity. During crisis with the European Fund and the use for Portugal, we had a common solidarity. So the big question is, if we want to put more solidarity on the table, how to do and how to deliver? I think first, it's always a, question, a, a sort of pari passu approach. We decided some solidarity approach during crisis in order not to die. But in peacetime, I would say, it's much more complicated, this kind of decision. That's why I do think that if you don't increase the level of control or the level of reform in key member states, that's why I do think that France could promote uh, uh, this, this kind of, uh, of measure. You are not credible. I mean, we, France first has to deliver. We have to reform the country to show we are here. And we can promote this kind of idea. But putting more solidarity in the system means creating a common borrowing capacity at the European level. For me, it was one of the key components of the Juncker plan. We failed that. But it means how to raise money altogether. I think it will be very complicated at, the, at 28. But when I spoke about a Eurozone approach, I do think that we should look at a common borrowing capacity. We should look at a common budget at the Eurozone level, which means it's not solidarity without constraints. And that's why I revert to my second dilemma, rules versus institution. You have a first way to articulate solidarity, which is to say, we will create solidarity with constraints. It's the sort of contracts we can think about. It doesn't fly, because you will put money on the table if basically the government complied with X criteria. I mean, that's a, you will create a bureaucracy, at least. I don't think you will create growth. But if you say, I have a sort of common body in charge of this budget, okay? I accept a solidarity approach. I mean, they will be in charge of our common house at the Eurozone area level. They should be responsible in front of a parliamentary body we have to think about. But this body in charge of the budget will have to deal with this solidarity but it will decide in light of the responsibility of each member state's region. So you need a proper regulation, but much more through an institution than through rules, according to me. But that's the two ways to articulate your solidarity. But solidarity should be accompanied by more convergence, i.e. more reforms at national level, and a proper governance, i.e. an adapted institution and democratic regulation. That's the two components for me of solidarity. So from scratch here, if we say we want more solidarity, you can indeed feel this feeling, which is they want my money, <laughs> which is not the purpose. If you don't create the proper governance and the proper conditions, you, it doesn't fly. But we should not create too much complexity to make it fly in the same time. As for the social democrat, I mean, the sort of software uh, uh, for, 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 for new social democrats and, and, and how basically to create this momentum, I would say, I would see, 
I mean, at least three items to be enlightened today in our discussion. First, I think you have to think about this two notions about fairness and efficiency. Fairness, when you are a social democrat, is not just about giving more formal rights to people, more formal protection, more formal protection from the government. It is how to provide more opportunities, more rights to access in real time, in, I mean, in real terms. So that's why we have basically to revisit the complexity of our rules, of our organization. Sometimes you have to revisit the rights of your insiders precisely to reopen, to unlock some situation. And simplification, unlocking agenda are part of this, social, uh, this new social democrat approach because that's the best way basically to deal with adapted safety net and market. And I refuse basically this dilemma between pure liberalism, absence of rules and so on, and over-constraining governments. Because today, in our situation, even with an over-constraining government, you don't protect properly young people, poor people, and so on. Because you kill a lot of opportunities for them. And in, I mean, in a lot of situations, they do prefer to have opportunities than subsidies. So you have to preserve your safety nets, but by unlocking a lot of situations precisely to create new opportunities. The second key point of this new social democrat DNA is about Europe. We have basically to endorse our European attachment. Europe was no more part of our DNA. I mean, during the past decade, which was a big mistake. Because Europe is precisely about how to articulate rule and solidarity, but is how to promote a common model we have together. And when you have a discussion, I mean, you can feel a lot of convergence with an American, for instance. But you see the difference between a German and American when you are French. You don't have the same social approach. You don't have the same sensitivity. We don't have the same common history. So this continent has something to tell to globalization. We have some common values. And these values, in order to be precisely promoted, need a common body, a common ambition, a common initiative. It's part of the social democrat area. It's part of the social democrat ambition. Because I do think that social democracy is one of the key political components of European history. You don't have a lot of, you don't have the equivalent of social democrats in Asia, exactly, or in America or in Africa. I mean, it's extremely, it's due to our past history. And if, if we wanted to, not just to survive, but to succeed in globalization, and to find the proper way precisely to win in globalization, you need social democracy at the European level. And the third point is about the proper regulation and the adapted governance. More in Europe, through this institution and the common ambition, and to redefine the national level, and to find the proper governance at the local level. That's why I do think about devolution of power not to block everything or to say the government doesn't want to take part of its responsibility, but at least on the social side, we have to think about such an agenda because we need adaptability. And adaptability is sort of permanent compromise, which is part of our DNA. And this permanent compromise is built on a common framework which, which has to be defined through the law and debated at the national level. But after that, you have to accept a sort of devolution to the social partners, to the unions, to local players, because they know much better than yourself how to deal with reality, their own constraints, and so on. So we need a big debate on how to protect and to adapt through this proper regulation. I think it's not a complete answer to your question, which was very much ambitious, but I think that's three first starting points of such a reflection. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, and I also know that you have interviews uh, lined up, but would it be okay if we take t two, more, two more questions? And then I have a proposal to make, because Hendrik gave such an excellent introductory set of comments. Why don't we ask him to come back and reflect on what you have said? And I'm sure he would agree to that, and he can then join us 
Yeah. But let's have uh, two questions, uh, Anael and um, Mostov. Anael, you first. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Monsieur Macron. Uh, my name is Anel Labinge. I'm working for the Stifterverband, a German business community initiative. You spoke about the convergence agenda between France and Germany. Besides of the minimum wage, which you mentioned, a minimum wage not organized decentrally by the unions, by, but centrally by the state here, what are concrete initiatives where Germany should adapt French policy ideas? Thank, thank you, Anel. Sigma. And there's a, the microphone is coming, and I have to apologize to everybody else. No, we, there's so many, in, but uh, there's little time. Apologies. Sigma. Uh, thank you for your speech. Um, you present us a lot of uh, good ideas for the reform program. Um, can we go a little bit deeper in, in an example, for example, in the energy field? What are your modernizations plan for the energy sector in France? Thank you. Okay. Now, I think minimum wage was indeed the first step toward convergence due to the current situation you had. And in a lot of sectors, I mean, the unbalanced situation was extremely hard, basically, uh, uh, to preserve. And I think you had a social demand on your side for, for, uh, for, for, for this change. So I think that's the first step. The second, the second way, I mean, we have a big agenda. The second point would be precisely to converge in terms of structuration and, and, and amount of this minimum wage together. It's part of the decade or 10 years common agenda. It's something which is not to be set up overnight, but I think it's something which will help precisely to create more mobility on the labor market when you have the same minimum wage with, at the same level between France and Germany. Second, I do think that on the energy side, I will revert on that, but we have a lot of things to be done and, convergence to create between France and Germany, especially on the supply side in France, we, we, we had perhaps a more coordinated approach uh, than in, in, in Germany. We were less aggressive on the renewable side, but uh, I think what, what we did on the supply side was important. On the demand side, we are much more influenced by your uh, uh, pro-entrepreneur's decision, and I think that's another way to converge as well. Uh, on this sector. On the digital economy as well, I think we have to make our rules converge. Uh, I think it's part of this convergence agenda and something, some of these rules which are the best way to deal with a big sensitivity on, on, on uh, uh, especially data is probably to look at the French rules which are a, a first starting point if, if your question was about what could inspire Germany in France. But I think it's much more how it's not just to inspire, but it's to find the, the right balance between sometimes our regulation to precisely make them converge. I think in corporate taxes, which is one of the key ways to make our economies <laughs> to converge, probably we, we have to converge to your rate, which is lower, and, and we have some tax credits. I think that our tax credit for research and development is very good and very attractive. It's something which could inspire Germany but we should decrease the rate as it is in your country precisely to be more competitive and have a sort of same level playing field between our two economies. That's, for me, first examples of, of a convergence agenda. As for energy, I think we diverged after Fuku uh, Fukushima crisis due to sudden decision of, of the German government. And I have to confess that you, I mean, you acted much more aggressively on the renewable side than we did. Now we are much more converging. Uh, I think first on, on energy-intensive companies, my, my, my willingness, and especially have a very uh, uh, trustful and, and, and efficient dialogue with Zygmar Gabriel, is to converge and to have a common, uh, a, a common system. It, it's an important part of your competitiveness package. You did very well in the past. The Commission now is blocking you, uh, uh, and we were very bad uh, on that in the past period because we always favored the, 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 the consumers. And, and basically, we, we always had a sort of disadvantage for our corporates. So I think we are converging on that. On the demand side, we have to work on re renewables, energy storage, and interconnections. That, for me, is the key, the key pillars of our convergence and our work together. And now, today, we have to face the very 
concerning situation of our players in the sector because they are very weak due to the current situation. But if we, we definitely work together on energy storage, interconnection, on specialization of our industries, I mean, I think we should not accelerate too much on renewables without looking at interconnections with German. You should perhaps stop with coal plants in order to favor much more gas and, 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 and perhaps nuclear industry. Uh, I mean, it's the best way to work together. It doesn't make sense for us to produce like crazy renewables. You have a lot of renewables. It doesn't make sense for you basically to re-import coal and open coal plants to kill gas plants and not to take our nuclear energy. So if I had to make a sort of caricature on a resume, I would say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, solidarity was one of the key terms, convergence. We heard about uh, competition and uh, coordination. Um, Henrik, what do you make of it? <laughs> you really put me on the spot here. Um, I, I introduced uh, the minister with three uh, ideas. One was reform, the second one was Europe, the third one was new social democracy. Let me take up each of those three and make one comment. On reform, in the report joint I wrote for you and uh, Sigmar Gabriel, we said, in France we fear lack of boldness, in Germany we fear complacency. I think this afternoon my fear has shifted more towards the German side. The second point is, um, on Europe, um, I really like in your speech the dilemma that you put up, especially the one between the Eurozone and the rest of the European Union. The question, and uh, you say we need to rebuild the Euro, just keep those words, we need to rebuild the Euro. I will keep this, this is very important. And we need to restore the single market. These are, this is straight talk. And the question is, can we do both at the same time, in particular, with the United Kingdom? And that's a question I keep, but I think the agenda is absolutely right. Now, third point, on, on social democracy, I really believe what you've described could be the starting point of this new continental left. The last time there was a reform in uh, the European left-wing agenda, it was the third way and was a very German-British approach. I think this time there could be a Franco-German approach to this new continental left based on everything you described, this idea of fairness, of solidarity, but in a specifically continental European fashion. So that makes me very happy. The crisis is not over, but there is hope. <laughs> or to put it in other words, <coughs> it's very stormy outside, but there is spring in this room. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, on that note, there's nothing to be added uh, other than to thank you and your team for coming here this afternoon. And hopefully we can see you soon again here at Hertie School. Thanks thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much.